Good evening, and a very warm welcome to all our viewers. My name is Samantha Castle, and I'm the Senior Manager for Alumni Relations at the University of Pretoria. Tonight, we are launching a very special series called the Lead UP in Conversation with the VC Series. This new series will see our Vice Chancellor and Principal moderate panel discussions with distinguished UP alumni. The Justice Ministers of both South Africa and Namibia are graduates of the University of Pretoria. And for our inaugural Lead UP in Conversation with the VC Chat, Prokopi invited both of them as special guests this evening, along with the Dean of our top-ranked law school, Professor Elsevi Stuman. Allow me to introduce our Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Tawana Kupe, who will be our moderator this evening. We hope you enjoy this discussion, and please don't forget to put your comments and questions on slido.com, and we look forward to an invigorating conversation with our panelists this evening. Over to you, Prof. Kupe. Thank you, Samantha. Senior Manager, Alumni Relations at the University of Pretoria. Welcome to the Lead UP in conversation with the VC Alumni Virtual Chat. I'm so delighted that all of you here and that the ministers and the dean are here. This event's tagline is, by the book, in conversation with South Africa and Namibia's justice ministers. And tonight, I'll be chatting to these ministers who are both UP graduates, as well as the dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Pretoria, the top rank law faculty on the continent. We wish throughout this conversation to get an idea into issues of justice, social justice, priorities of the ministers, how the countries have handled their COVID regulations and laws, and also learn more about the investor of Pretoria's uh, faculty of law, which is, as you know, ranked number one by the Times Higher Education ranking. Of course, uh, the university is delighted that the ministers could attend and that you could also uh, attend. Without further ado, I would like therefore to present the Honorable Minister Ronald Lamola, the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services in South Africa, the Honorable Minister Yvonne Dausab, the Minister of Justice in Namibia, both UP graduates, proudly UP graduates. Then of course, Professor Elsa Biskoman, the Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Pretoria and the first woman to be Dean of the Law Faculty in South Africa in, in, at, at the University of Pretoria. I must add here that uh, her deputy, uh, Professor Charles Maimela, is the youngest Deputy Dean of Law ever at the University of South Africa and the first Black person to be Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Law, the top ranked Faculty of Law. In, 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 in South Africa and in Africa. As you have heard from Samantha, please use slido.com uh, with the, the code up 9 sep in order to insert your questions and also to follow our polls. All polls will run from Slido as well and participants can vote on the, on the platform, on this platform. So the poll, the first poll which we are going to run would be we, the question would be, would you like to hear more stories from UP alumni who are influential leaders in their sector? So the options are yes, I'd like to hear more. No, I would not. I would like then now to move, if you like, to our first question to both the dean and the ministers of justice. As you know. The University of Pretoria's Faculty of Law has been ranked the best place to study law, not only in South Africa, but in Africa as a whole, by the Times Higher Education World University rankings by subject. Having graduated from this faculty, what would you say sets, sets it apart from others in your country and on the continent? Yes, you can go first, uh, Minister Yvonne Kassab. Yeah, thank you. I, I thought I'd go first because I'm the guest uh, on the panel. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Professor Cooper, thank you very much for that very uh, warm introduction. Uh, and I want to repeat, because this is a live session, uh, a warm congratulations to both the minister uh, who, uh, who 
I have a number, and and we've 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 sent congratulatory messages to each other. Uh, I remember on the twenty eighth of March this year, uh, and since then we've both been very busy. But also a, a very very warm congratulations to the dean uh, for being the first woman. I think it's 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 a, it's a nice feat uh, to be part of. Uh, Prof, let me just say two quick things. Um, the first one, I think. What I have seen from from the publishing profile of the university through Pulp, um, it, it is a nice thing to have is, is your own publishing house because it encourages research, it, it encourages students to publish. And because I was a, a postgraduate student, that was something that you, you, you'd want to be part of. The secondly, the kind of support that you get from the university is very, very important uh, in terms of what are the resources available and how accessible are, are those resources. So, so, so I think for me, those are the two key things that are important if you're talking about what sets a university apart. But maybe a last one for me, because I was at the center of, of human rights and there's a unique program, what set that program apart was the fact that you had over 25, more than 30 or so, uh, students from all over Africa that we had access to. And I think for me, that that experience um, uh, is very, very unique uh, if, I, if I look at any other university uh, on the continent in terms of, 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 of its scope um, and, and... Thank you. Thank you, Minister Delsa. Minister Lamola, it's interesting that you didn't just take one master's degree from the faculty. You took two master's degrees from the faculty. A person only goes back to the same shop if they have good experience and want more of the same. So what is it? <laughs> yes, uh, Prof. And that is the exact reason why I, <clears throat> I went back to the faculty. But firstly is to uh, thank you for the warm welcome and the flowering uh, introduction. Uh, and, the, and the dean of the faculty, welcome and uh, all the best. Yes, I have uh, already congratulated uh, Ms. Yvonne uh, on her appointment and uh, wishing her all the best uh, because we are within the Southern region and the African continent. It's a new breed of leadership uh, for this continent uh, and for the Southern region. And I think um, that's, uh, it's a very important, particularly for, for the rule of law in our region. The, what the, what it has set apart for me, uh, Prof, and that's the reason why I, I came back and back and back is because of the of the of the of the support and the online library that was easily accessible with the good support uh, and um, even uh, within the the the, the 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 program that I did first, I, I hear you are saying I, I did the the two masters degrees, but I did not start there. The first one was the. Uh, a certificate in competition law uh, in terms of the diversity and also the 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 the, the, the instructors they were able to to guide us and and i was already working uh, at that time i never thought i'll again go back to to to, to school but it made it so easy and um, it then encouraged me to then do the masters and when i did my first masters uh, i thought i may not finish because uh, the first day in class uh, i could see uh, Professor Delport was shocked that now there is a leader of the Euclid in this class. There's going to be chaos and uh, there will be no harmony. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I think um, we, we ended up uh, getting up uh, very well and the nice diversity within the class and the uh, camera data made it uh, possible for us to, to achieve the, the, the outcomes, uh, I think, uh, at the time. And uh, the second one was also a very good one because it was more practical with the people with practical experience from the from in the, it was the first of its kind in, in the African continent, and that mm -hmm. what they attracted me because it brought the uh, divergent um, expertise uh, in terms of practical of doing the work, geologists, engineers, and then um, surveyors and so forth. So that uh, to me then told me that th there is a beginning of a convergence of professions. And I felt that was very unique uh, contribution because um, uh, as an undergraduate student, you only think of the law. But when you are now in practice, you, you now realize that um, all these professions, there's somewhere where they converge. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Dean, uh, 
you you I want to bring you in, but also I want you as well as I'm asking the ministers, how should tertiary institutions like UP or yours prepare students for you know professions in the justice space and in policy making in general? Thank you, Professor Kupe, and thank you for the warm introduction. And also, um, good evening to the two ministers. I'm really honoured to be in your company. Um, and of course, two very, very important alumni from our faculty. Congratulations again on your academic achievements as well. So, Professor Kupe, I don't know if you know this, but um, this year marked 40 years ago that I was a first-year student at the University of Pretoria. That's a very long time ago. And this faculty has come a long way. I never thought I would be the dean of this faculty, but I really <laughs> treasure this university and, and this faculty. Yes, um, I think um, you have to be um, you have to be relevant these days if you if you want to be a successful university, if you want to be a successful faculty. We um, we follow an inquiry approach to all our teaching and. Um, we are very well equipped, and I think that's one of the things that um, that puts us ahead, maybe, of other universities. As you've mentioned, we are in the top 100 in the world. It's also very important for a university in Africa to have an African focus, and I'm very pleased that both our ministers here tonight, they've done master's programs at um, my faculty where we have a very strong um, African focus. Um, both master's degrees uh, were focused on Africa and as you know we have the Center for Human Rights and they've got many programs focused on on Africa but we are also very strong internationally we are one of only three faculties um, on the continent that um, that are members of the um, law schools global league and uh, therefore we also collaborate with a lot of international partners for us it's important to be an African law faculty within a globalized world. We've got a very large doctoral program and um, we also aim with that doctoral program to make it relevant, to make it practical for students. When they enroll for that, they can use those skills. And finally, I would like to say that proof of the fact that we are relevant is that within this COVID pandemic, we have even become more active. So the Center for Human Rights, they have launched a series of webinars. Our insurance unit has been very active as well, applying insurance law to the very unique problems that arose during the COVID um, pandemic. And finally, our Center for Child Law, they've been very active as well. They intervened in a number of court proceedings and um, Minister Dalsab will appreciate this because um, she also works in this area. One case they um, intervened in regard to the access of children living with um, disabilities to schools. So we have been so relevant with this COVID pandemic. And I think that's what um, universities and law faculties should be. We should be able to apply the theory of law in practice. Thank you, Professor Pupe. Thank you, Dean. I think you have... Uh and your salary increment for this year with that uh, uh, CGS. Uh, Minister Dawson. <laughs> uh, Jess, thank you very much. Uh, Prof, maybe to add to, maybe tagging on to what uh, Minister Amola was saying about the need for acknowledging the disciplinary nature of, 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 of law, but also um, there's a brilliant book actually that was written by Professor Franz, Franz Fulhun from the faculty, um, you know, called Beyond Law. And, and it, it looks at the multidisciplinary nature um, and the interaction that law has with other uh, sciences, uh, particularly social sciences. Now, this is important uh, for the question you're asking, Prof. The question you're asking is how do we prepare our students uh, both, I suppose both at uh, 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 undergraduate and postgraduate level for their interaction if they want to get into the political space. For me, the you know it's important that you're teaching staff 
um, the profile of your teaching staff is important. So, you know, that they're not one track minded, that they have a, a broad understanding of, of the social and political dynamics in the country. But also it's important um, that the publishing profile of the faculty reflects the issues that the society is dealing with. Like Professor Skuman is talking about how the faculty is responding to issues around the pandemic and so forth. But for me, what I've seen, and, and this is also something I shared at the University of Namibia, is that what I've seen is over the years that the faculties have focused on what we would, you know, your normal human rights and other substantive areas. Whereas um, there are other areas of law um, that also allows you to engage with, with society. Areas of law reform, areas of legislative drafting, for example, um, and also engagement, uh, for example, with the Office of the Attorney General. Something that our students would not otherwise uh, be familiar with. And that kind of engagement, curriculum uh, focus, would help with um, you know, preparing our students to be able to diversify because law is one area where our students have not sufficiently diversified for example media and the law what is it, what is what is our law students engagement with the media what is their engagement with community activities what is their engagement with social justice activities so we need to redesign if we have not already done so i'm sure um, the university of pretoria may have gone ahead and develop and design a curriculum that that responds to the needs um, of the societies in which we live minister lamola you want to add something on that one no you're covered okay so uh, i'm covered. No, you're covered let me me move on both of you reference directly or referred and so did the dean that you are you are relatively young ministers so i'd like to ask you whether the next time i'm interviewing you you might be president of your own countries and what your own thoughts are on the inclusion of young people in the governing of our countries i note that in namibia i think there's a very young minister who's uh, in her 20s and if i'm not mistaken she is a minister of is it communications no Yes, she's actually the deputy minister. She's 23. Yeah. Um, and, and she was uh, selected just like myself by the uh, the eight that the president uh, selects. So our president has actually been uh, very, very progressive and revolutionary, I think, um, in, in making that decision to make a 23-year-old a, a, a deputy minister, you know, because the next thing should uh, obviously be the consideration to become minister and so forth but she's doing an excellent job and she's also been um, actually acknowledged as one of the hundred most influential people in africa so she's really making um, namibia very proud in her engagement with with, uh, with the global world but also her interaction with the youth at the local level so to answer your question prof um, just to say, uh, because I think uh, Minister uh, Lamola will probably uh, take uh, an extensive view on this one. But for me, two things that are important. The one is um, engagement at political level, because the manner our governance structure works, um, I mean, I know both in Namibia and South Africa, it's really based on, on the political activity. And, and political parties and and we have ruling parties and you know you know and 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 when i'm saying ruling parties i'm not just talking about necessarily swap and anc uh, i'm also talking about any party that's going to rule at any given time so there is it's important for youth um to for, for us young people, i'm not so young uh, i know i look young uh, but you know i'm over the youth bracket of 35. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And, and I suspect uh, Minister Lamola may also have a slight challenge, but I suspect he's younger than 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 all of us here. Is is that we'll have to they will have to make inroads into a political space. Political party involvement is very important. Um, I do think also that political parties, particularly those of us who've been in the space, and I'm specifically referring to Swapo and the ANC. 
is that we need to think about how to make our rules of engagement a bit more flexible so that young people can get into the system. And here I'm talking about membership because the biggest challenge that young people have is how they get involved at the level of structures. And if you are not involved at the level of structures, whether it is your section, your branch, your district, and eventually the region, uh, depending on, I mean, South Africa has a slightly different profile, um, you, you may have a challenge where young people, if they're not politically active, even if they're competent, may not be able to get into the system. So we need to, as, as political parties and as political leadership, particularly the older guard of the, of the political leadership, we need to think about how do we deliberately take steps to get our young people um, to get into the system. Minister Lamola. Yeah, no, thanks, uh, Prof. Kupen. Uh, my view is that this sign is sig signals a new era in uh, African politics and in the Southern region, that um, <clears throat> there, there is space uh, to participate in meaningful um, engagements and decision-making for young people, not only with regards to politics, but uh, for boards, for uh, leaderships of sports, uh, bodies, and so forth. <clears throat> that um, the, the requirements uh, soon going forward, it will no longer be the fact that you are in exile or you are from Robben Island, but um, the, the, the capabilities and the skills of a new generation is what is now going to guide us. And I think that practical experience that um, a, a, a Minister Joseph have plays a very significant role in the cabinet itself when decisions have to be taken, the understanding of that practical life. And I think uh, that is the same uh, kind of uh, knowledge and uh, kind of perspective that we bring into the space, into the body politics in cabinet and in politics as a whole, that we are now able to bring real practical experience of practice of academia post-democracy. So I think for me, uh, this is, 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 a, is a signal that a, a, a new generation must now uh, take uh, come to the fourth and uh, reshape the SADC region and also the, 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 the African continent. And um, there is a space for young people to do so in various platforms, as she has already said, of political parties, but also uh, various movements that are still playing a role in influencing the trajectory of society. And also the various platforms like NGOs and uh, churches, they could still uh, uh, exert some kind of influence in the trajectory of our society and uh, of the African continent uh, as a whole. So I'm going to ask you a bit of a tricky question now is that you sit in cabinet with your colleagues. So some of them could break the law and be candidates to be arrested or decisions could be made which later on the courts find are unconstitutional, invalid. And you said there, and you were a party to the under collective cabinet responsibility, you were a party to that. Don't you feel like you have, uh, in the first one, that uh, you are sitting on a very tight fence on the second one, that you did not do the job properly? No, 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 no. Uh, 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 it's an easy one. The, 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 the justice must prevail, though heavens may fall. It doesn't matter who and how. The rule of law must be the anchor of any constitutional democracy. Yeah. So that one can't be negotiated. On the second one, there will obviously be challenges in that regard. The key thing is whether uh, the, 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 the advice that the department has provided Mm -hmm. Was it uh, informed by the objective factors? Was it rational? And uh, and uh, was there no ulterior motive? If there was no ulterior motive, it was done in a manner that um, all the checks and balances are put. And we, we really firmly believed it was within the boundaries of the Constitution. Um, uh, 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 it, it does not mean that we don't know our job. It's the reality that um, law... Uh, the, 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 the dean of the faculty can say there could be different arguments to different viewpoints and opinions up until a court has said and said this interpretation is wrong and uh, and so forth but the key thing is that we need to do it within the ambits of the constitution okay yeah minister 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you know it's 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 the principle of hermeneutics because once you uh, and so there will always be a question around the challenge of the interpretive challenges that we have. So so we have a supreme constitution, and and I sit in this in, in the fortunate position that we have an attorney general, and the attorney general is uh, constitutionally endowed with the responsibility to provide legal advice. Um, to, to cabinet. And, and then, then, then there's also the constitutional obligation of cabinet members to take collective responsibility for, for decisions. So, so here is what is important. It's when you need to, to provide advice, when you need to participate in those decisions, it is always, always um, for me consistently to, to provide the advice that is correct so not to, uh, uh, you know, speak uh, untruth to power in a way. And whatever the decision is, you know, we have to stand or fall by that particular decision as a collective. But I think in the end, you are, we are guided by, by the supremacy of our constitution. And of course, we are provided by the interpretive challenges that you'd have in any setup where various views um, would make up uh, what what the correct position would be. But I the, the buck for us as, uh, ends with the Attorney General. If we're sued, uh, the Attorney General is the one that would have to then uh, defend uh, the government in any particular issue. But I always try and, and, and speak the truth. Yeah. So I'm going to push both of you, and I want a yes or no answer on this one. If cabinet, uh, including the president, took a decision you really totally disagreed with, would you resign or stay on? So, so, so I think the, the the principle of collective responsibility suggests that if you have lost the debate, because that's really what we should focus on, is how do you convince the rest of the collective? to follow what you are saying. And if you don't succeed on that part, there are only two things that is left. You stand with a decision of cabinet, um, that is, that's a constitutional obligation, um, or if it goes against the grain of your principles and values and you cannot defend it publicly, then yes, the correct thing would be to resign. Mr. Lamora. Mr. Lamora. Yeah, no, I doubt the cabinet can take a decision deliberately knowing it is unconstitutional. Uh, I, I have seen it uh, myself with uh, now, particularly with the regulations. You will have seen sometimes there will be delays and so forth. It was because we're still waiting for legal opinions on various issues and regulations because cabinet always wants to make sure that uh, the decisions are informed by proper legal, uh, 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 sound legal, uh, are taken on a sound legal basis. And um, various of them, some of them have been challenged, but we were convinced because of the legal opinions that we received. And the uh, cabinet would say, uh, this um, decision is within the ambit of the law and that of the constitution. But some could be challenged and be found to be wanting by the courts and all those things. But the reality is that by the time we take the decision, uh, it is uh, within the ambit of the law in our view. And um, it is also in the interest of the country. So it is, um, I doubt we can have really that kind of a, of, a, of a situation. What could happen is that um, the decision can be lawful, but you don't agree with it. Yes, yeah. Yes, and uh, I mean, uh, that is the reality that uh, you have lost a debate. Uh, your other colleagues, a persuasive argument or superior logic has prevailed. You will have to stand by the collective decision. <laughs> okay. Pro, uh, Dean, what do you teach their students who become ministers, judges, and so on to do when such situations arise? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are muted, uh, Prof. No, that's, that's one of the statements of the year. You are muted. I was muted. Unmute yourself. <laughs> I was muted by, by the, by the um, uh, manager, I believe, yes. Um, yes, so, so the students always want to know, but what mm -hmm. is the answer? And I always tell them there's no mm -hmm. single correct answer. Um, you have to argue. You have to argue in a balanced way. You have to argue both sides. And then you have to come to a decision uh, based on authority. And so that is why there can be different answers. That is why 
um, cases go through the courts and they are appealed mm. and they go on to the next court. So it's a very complicated business, <laughs> yeah. this, this no, business of law. Is <laughs> oh, I just wanted to add that uh, even with the court court, sometimes uh, they are disagreeing. Yeah. You can see and read from the court's opinion that they were not agreeing with the view, yeah. even uh, the legal interpretation. Yeah. <laughs> Prof, just a quick one, just to, just to say that, you know, that the, the issue about collective decision making is, is that, and, and, I, and I like what, what Minister Lamola was saying about, we need to know that all the decisions that cabinet takes, it's, it's invariably in the, in the best interest of, of, of the people. It may not, it, we may not always agree with it. But you know what they say is we must ensure that we take a decision believing in good faith that it was the right decision that we took at that particular time. Okay. Yeah, so yes, I think we do for um, uh, another I point. Think, uh, in Professor Kube, even, even the one of burning alcohol was in the best interest of the country. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Banning tobacco. <laughs> I'm quite sure, That's dangerous. I'm quite sure there's a lot of people who disagree with you on that one. Um, Marius, I think is it, we have results now for the for the uh, we are poll question for the second one is um which types of leaders would you like to hear more from in the future? Political leaders, business leaders, civil society leaders, women in leadership, academic administrators, in other ways, vice chancellors like me. We like to be, we like to be, we like to also to talk to you. Please vote uh, at least UP9 SEP. Now, moving on then, or oh, do we have, uh, we, I guess we'll get the results for the poll, uh, for the first poll later. But what I want to move on now to is a, a question I'll start with a statement. Justice delayed is justice denied. I want the ministers to say to me whether they believe the justice systems they are responsible for do not have inordinate delays that result particularly in poor people who cannot afford legal fees and just generally in uh, the, principle, the statement justice delayed is justice uh, denied, being the situation and being the perception of the justice system. Yeah. Shall I? Yeah, you can go. <laughs> it's like we are in that corridor situation where we are trying to, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, since I became justice minister, of course, I was, I was in the a law and justice sector for a very long time. Um, I, I have tried to anchor the understanding of justice generally, but also that conception of justice uh, with with what I call justice imperatives. So, so what what does justice look like uh, in Namibia? And it was really informed by the kinds of complaints I was getting um, in my office since since I was appointed as minister, and 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 so for me. The, the five or so imperatives were the fact that, you know, you need to, if you want to have, if you're talking about justice denied um, and, and is justice delayed, you're talking about do you have um, a sufficient safeguards, constitutional provisions and protections that deals with issues um, of justice. I mean, and there are very, very forms of them, but fair trial rights, uh, the, you know, the right to dignity sort of sums that up for me. But of course, there are other rights. But for me, I, I look at them from that perspective. And then and then the second uh, aspect is um, the efficacy of your justice or particularly your criminal justice system. You know, how efficient is it? In other words, do you have access to courts? You know, are prosecutors available and competent? Do you have magistrates? You know, and are they available and are they uh, competent and do they have integrity? Um, and, and then, you know, so, so, it's, it's, so that's, your, that's your second aspect. And then it's also the question around legal advice and, and, and aspects around legal aid, for example. So do people have access to legal presentation? 
and also what is the quality of lawyers that people get you know because sometimes uh, people complain that because it's a lawyer that i'm not paying for it's it's a state paying people are neglecting um, their responsibility they're not handling the matters in the professional manner in which they should handle them um so it's it's a question around legal advice and legal aid but but a, a, another important one that is not so at the forefront uh, when we talk about justice delays is justice denied is the question around legal services and here i'm specifically talking about um, access to maintenance payments something that is very important for for particularly vulnerable communities in our society questions around estate services uh, for instance the the effectiveness of the master of the high court you know in the appointment letters in the finalization of deceased estates uh, questions around insolvencies um, and so forth so so for me uh, and then of course the other important aspect which has to do with dean skuman is the question around um, the involvement involvement of of the academia um, and and also the involvement of um, legal practitioners and here i'm talking about the ind independent legal profession in in questions of of social justice because we haven't used um, the law to enhance social justice sufficiently i think um, and i've seen that very acutely during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So what role do lawyers play, um, you know, when limited service are uh, services are available to members of our public, when there is reduced income, you know, and you, you have been retrenched and you need a, a lawyer, would the lawyer who's also struggling uh, to make ends meet uh, represent that particular client for free? So it's, it's a number of dynamics, but I think it has to do with understanding the context, because sometimes justice delayed um, is not necessarily always because um, of the state. You know, justice delayed is sometimes has to do with the various parties that are involved in the proceedings. And I don't think we always understand that sometimes the accused person, for example, is, is the reason why a, a matter is not proceeding as it should. Or the number of witnesses that you have um, that has to get through the trial proceedings and cross-examination and so forth that, that prolongs um, the particular proceedings. I mean, we had a... A, a treason trial that ran for over 10 years in Namibia, you know, and, and it had over 100 plus witnesses um, that had to, to be called. So it's, it's really the context that is also important when we talk about justice delayed is justice denied. I wonder whether there was a Stalin -like strategy in that case here, but Minister Lamola. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Prof. Kupe. Uh, I'm also wondering. The, 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 uh, the, for me, the end also justify the means. Uh, 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 in, in, in that, um, on the point that uh, Ms. Jasup ended, <clears throat> I have also answered the question in Parliament, I think, a week ago on the same issue that um, how many uh, accused persons do we have in our correctional facilities who have been there for, for more than five years uh, where their trial has not been completed. And um, on, on, on going through the number of the accused, I can't remember, there were about 27 or so of them. And then I had to go through why the trial was not um, uh, finalized. And uh, as she says, and most of the, the reasons were, were, were because of the accused, either they were sick, or either they, they changed lawyers uh, from time to time because they are delaying the trial, uh, either the other co-accused, they are not there, particularly where you find that this is more than three or four accused and all that kind of a situation. But there could also be delays uh, that have also been occasioned by from our side uh, in terms of investigations not having, having been completed, particularly in the criminal justice uh, system, uh, witness statements, and all those kind of things. But I think uh, at the end, um, that long process sometimes does produce um, fair results for, for everyone. The only challenge is the time period and um, the issues that then will affect the victims, because also the victims 
uh, wants to see an expeditious end to this um, ordeal or to the trial, which is also not only in the interest of the victims, but in the interest of the community at large and society as a whole. So that dissection of that kind of intriguing difficulty, it's what we grapple with on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think the, one of the key features and outcomes of this uh, period of COVID is the reality that we need to modernize the criminal justice system in terms of technology, in terms of use of um, uh, relevant uh, other electronic means of uh, expediting and fast-tracking processes. Hence, um, we are also looking at uh, our own uh, Criminal Procedure Act to enable us to run a, a full a full blown criminal trial on an online platform like this and so so some of them of those rules and so forth we will need to to modernize them to be compatible with modern society because some of the delays as i was looking into the records they could be uh, mitigated by uh, the use of technology okay so prof dean's command what does academic research say are the reforms that need to happen to ensure that justice delayed and is not justice denied? Yes, uh, thank you, Prof. Kupe. It's all about access to justice. And I actually want to support the two ministers. I don't think you can rush the law. It's far more important to reach the correct decision, and it might take time. I know I won't be popular for saying this, but it is better to take time and reach the um, the correct decision. But I also think it's important what um, Ms., uh, Minister Lamola is saying, that um, we can effect certain reforms and uh, we may be able to uh, make the process quicker and more efficient. We've now seen how easy it is to get so many people together on one forum tonight, even from Namibia, and we did not even have to leave our homes. So I think there, there, there's a lot of things that we can do, and we are certainly looking into that to, to concentrate much more on um, online courses and also how to practice online, how to effect these, uh, these procedures online. I think that's going to be crucial uh, going forward to be able to effect justice efficiently. But I want to emphasize, we still need to go through the process. We can't rush it. Mm -hmm. Minister Joseph. Just, just Professor Skuman and, and, and the slide, the issue around uh, digitization, um, an important one, I think everybody is realizing it now, but it does have one problem, and that is the fact that not everybody um, has access to digital devices. And I think uh, what the pandemic has shown us, whether it was in the education sector, whether it's in the justice sector, is, is it has shown us the divide between the haves and, and the have-nots. And, and when you're talking about access to justice, this is another thing that we've realized uh, when you're talking about justice systems and, and its accessibility to the ordinary man on the street, is that without people actually having to walk to the door of the master's office or to the maintenance office you know i mean with with maintenance payments it's easy because you can have a bank account and one assumes that everybody can try and have a bank account um but you you would have a real challenge that you could leave some people out but i think it's an important uh, migration uh, from from manual way of doing things to having to be in the same room um than to to be able to do it through a digital platform so there's also been critiques that uh, perhaps uh, imprisoning people and incarceration is an outdated form of meting out justice. And there's a lot of academic research, especially in the United States and in Europe that I have read. So what, what are you, given also that in African conditions often overcrowding in jails, I was listening to our, the judge who does the inspecting of prisons, a uh, judge, uh, judge Cameroon, he's, he's retired now. When I listened to his interview yesterday, he was very scathing about some of the prison conditions and why some people are even in prison and weren't given an alternative form of. What would you say yourselves about whether we should use a incarceration in the manner in which we are? Especially also sometimes, and as you say, you agree, there are some delays for people who are on you know, remand for a long time. Their case eventually comes to court and they are found not guilty or in fact, they are given a much lighter sentence than they were in jail. So is the incarceration and putting people in jail 
still um, the most appropriate form of doing these things. Of course, not everybody is incarcerated for any crime. I take that for granted. But for the people yeah. that are incarcerated. Yeah, no, it, it is still one of the most appropriate. I agree that you need a mixture uh, mm -hmm. in, in that regard. We, 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 we have um, a prison population of about 155,000 now. Uh, but it was at around 170,000 before the president gave what is called a special remission and special parole. Out of those, about 55,000 are remand detainees. So it's almost a quarter of our prison population is remand detainees who are awaiting trial prisoners. And, and um, <clears throat> it does worry us that then when these processes take long, it does mean that um, we are now having people in their huge numbers who have taken the space of those that have now uh, are sentenced to, 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 to be in our facilities because um, our whole capacity is at around 112,000 for the whole country, but we're at 155, which is uh, about 20 or above 20% 20 uh, 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 population. I think where the judge has a point is on the point on the, on the fact that um, uh, from our research and observation is that um, those that have been in our facilities for less than for very petty crimes or what you can call high low risk um, crimes of less than two years, uh, they are the majority in terms of reoffending or what is called recidivism. Those that have stayed for more than five years. I think the system has really touched them in terms of um, rehabilitation programs and also them also understanding that when they go out, they need to, to behave differently and uh, in a different context. But those that have stayed for a very short term, um, uh, sometimes they go out and commit very heinous crimes and uh, which uh, shock the nation, even shocks the world. And in terms of states, those are the majority. So that is the is the balance that we need to strike in terms of those short term kind of offenses that mm. some of them can be handled through community corrections and and all that. But how then do you balance the real contradictions that exist in society? That society wants to see somebody who has offended society imprisoned, mm. and in the view of society, that person must be punished. You know, they, 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 in society's view. Uh, you being at your place, uh, reporting to the police, doing community service, doing some work is not real punishment. So I think that is the contradiction that we we find ourselves dealing with, uh, Prof. Minister, then I'll come to you, Dean, about what research might show us about what are credible alternatives. Thank, thank you very much, Prof. Um, I, you know, I, I'm not responsible for prisons. It's, it's a different minister, and it's interesting. And I think it's, you know, we were actually looking at the South African model of the Minister of Justice also being responsible for for correctional services. But 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 I but I take the, the one thing um, that there is that I agree with is that there's need to reform. Um, generally correctional services, but also sentencing op options. Uh, one of my former students at the University of Namibia actually wrote a brilliant piece. Um, he, he, while he was at Oxford, on uh, we need to look at reforming sentencing purpose um, in Namibia. And I know that we now have legislation on what we call ch child justice. And, and if you predicate it on the child justice model, what he is proposing around understanding the purpose of sentencing, you know, we will have to look at reforming it. And, and the reform would obviously be based on the role of the, you know, what is the, the profile of the offender, the community, the, the crime itself, but also how do we look at, and he actually placed it in a paradigm of Ubuntu and the African value system. So he, is the African value system uh, based on punishment or restoration? So the notion of restorative justice um, is something I think that's been talked about a lot. We have certainly incorporated that aspect in, in our child justice system um, and, and, and legislation that we are proposing at the moment. But I think sentencing, uh, you know, and, and the reforms around sentencing should not just be left to courts. Um, he argues, and I and I agree with him. It should be something that is already 
through maybe perhaps through a legislative and policy thinking, um, we, we can already develop that kind of thinking in our in our legislation. So definitely, I think uh, we need to look at the reform around those areas. But should we take people out of out of out of incarceration? Um, do we have alternative places? Where we people still have a sense that they're serving, uh, that they are, you know, kind of not punished, but they are being, um, that they are doing, that they are restoring some form of justice for the wrong that they have done. Because law is based on um, finding a remedy, you know, in the event that you have been wrong. So it, it you know, we cannot take a, take away that principle. Of, of what law, how law works, and, and the concept of justice is based on finding a remedy for for, for wrongdoing. So it's it's a, it's a long it's a long debate, Prof. But I think one that we should think about. Dean, uh, I'll just respond very briefly. Yes, I'm also not not really in favour of incarceration. And um, rehabilitation is really, really important for me. And so, Professor Cooper, you will also appreciate this. I think they, um, there should be ample opportunity in the prisons for people to educate themselves, you know, libraries and to, to further their education. And I think that is very important if we have to have people in prisons that they should be able to do that. And I know that they are able to do that in many prisons. Also know in other countries, they, um, you know, they, they are uh, privately owned prisons, for example. I don't know whether that, uh, you know, works better. Um, but of course, I think a lot of research still needs to be done. And um, the person who finds the solution will no doubt win the Nobel Prize, I'm sure. We'll move on now to the ministers on the tricky question of corruption, especially corruption by that involves People who are political office holders and in political parties in both countries, there have been recent uh, scandals, uh, 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 corruption scandals. In Namibia, it's the, the fish scandal, as the minister knows, or the fish scandal, as the media would call it. And in South Africa, there have been allegations, and uh, here one is talking about allegations around, you know, tenders for <laughs> PPE and other related matters. As you know, corruption normally reduces the public's confidence in leaders. And let me here also add that one shouldn't look at corruption in the by public police uh, uh, office holders only, because for a corrupt for for a corrupt actor, okay, there's a corrupter and a corruptee, if you like. That the private sector is not uh, is not immune to that. In both countries, also in South Africa, we have a massive scandal called Steinha, uh, Steinhoff, where there was a, a serious a, 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 a fraud by the, the chief executive office. So white collar crime is a big thing. So what do you think we should be doing in Southern Africa to you know, prosecute uh, 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 people involved in corruption, in part also to restore public confidence in politics? And because I hear many students, uh, I'm a vice chancellor and I've been a dean, all of that. All along the way, when I spoke to young students, they were saying politics is not for me. Those people are corrupt. So how do we stop young people becoming cynical about politics? Because in part, they think that people are corrupt and have power. Get away with it. Yeah, Prof, you, you are not far off when you said Stenger is. Uh, it's also the operations of Hullet. <laughs> it's the operations. <laughs> <laughs> the the Hullet uh, uh, yeah. operations. They they also have their own scandal of uh, no. yeah. Board. It's yeah. Not on the yeah. I, I I think uh, uh, for the students, Prof, they, they must start by being uh, people of integrity in their SRCs and uh, their <laughs> own <laughs> governments. How <laughs> was it? high integrity? I can assure you, you the SRC is high integrity. <laughs> but on a, serious, on, a, on a serious note, I think that the rule of law has to reign supreme in any kind of a, in an environment. And um, I think um, we also need to ensure that the, the institutions aimed to fight corruption, they are properly resourced, but also the legislative um, instruments enables them to do their job in terms of independency, in terms of them uh, being able to take decisions without um, uh, being uh, any kind of influence from anyone. And the only guide should be the constitution and what could be their enabling legislation. 
But the, the, the present question for, 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 for us as a country, in my view, is that um, corruption has become very sophisticated. And um, as you are referring to Stenhoff, you are referring to Hullard, and um, even our own corruption in the public um, uh, service space uh, with the PFMA and the MFMA, it does need also sophisticated kind of, uh, of a skills of a multidisciplinary nature. Uh, which combines uh, forensic, combines accounting, combines uh, analytical skills, uh, and so forth. So that is the instrument that we need to be able to, to build within the institutes of the state that are aimed to fight uh, corruption. But firstly, it will be preventative measures in terms of the instruments, because once it happens, it becomes expensive uh, to deal with it. We are... Um, at uh, 700 and uh, we're almost at 720 million for the Zondo Commission of Inquiry. Mm -hmm. So you can see the expensiveness of corruption once it has occurred. So hence we are currently working on more instruments to deal with preventative measures uh, with the Auditor General, with the National Treasury to, to prevent it from happening. And I think that should also be a program that happens also in the private sector with the JSE, also dealing with rules and regulations that will ensure that within the accounting uh, processes of private or listed companies, they are also uh, preventative measures, ethical leadership, and compliance to the King's Code. So I think that should be our first call as a nation uh, in terms of integrity, in terms of prevention. Then when it does happen, you need those well-resourced independent institutions to be able to, to deal with it. Yeah, thank you, Minister. Minister, we're now kind of running towards the end of time, so make your answer direct and shorter. <laughs> yes, let, let me make it short, and it actually saves me. But just to say that corruption brings, you know, it, it does point out that difference uh, and the importance of the separation of powers. Because, it, it, you know, your judiciary and your executive many instances, I mean, ours is an example of that, is kind of pitted against each other. So it's important to recognize that these institutions are, are independent uh, and separate. But also that there are certain principles of law. Uh, for example, the presumption of innocence um, is an important one uh, that, that our people don't always want to accept, but it's, it's the reality. If you want these institutions to work well, you need to make sure um, that you keep them separate. But thirdly is how you support the institutions that investigate um, any allegations, uh, particularly of, of, of high profile corruption. It's important that the investigators are competent. It's important that the prosecutors and, and the judicial oversight bodies uh, are well resourced, re well resourced and, and, and competent because the kinds of corruption that we experience is also very complex. And, and it requires uh, all the resources. And it's important for the government, particularly the executive, to be seen as supporting those institutions so that they can do their work um, effectively. In one minute, Dean. Yes, I agree with both, both ministers. Um, fraud has become so sophisticated and we need very, very sophisticated systems. So it's a lot of research to be done in regard to that as well. And also I think it's very, very important to um, develop programs um, also to assist in the um, education and the research of this area. Okay, now I think we're coming to the end of our program. I really would like to thank the ministers for attending. I wasn't, when we thought of this, First, we didn't think they would agree. Second, we thought they would agree. Then the uh, urgent business of the state will lead them to cancel, but it, that <laughs> didn't happen as well. So they've set a very high standard for ministers who are alumni of universities. So I'll now go for other areas of government where we have alumni. We have five or six others, I think. I won't uh, mention them now. But thank you very much. I think public debates of this nature are important. The University of Pretoria believes that one of its impact in society is to bring leaders in society, in government, in the public sector, in these kinds of platforms. We are going to continue with these conversations with the Vice Chancellor and alumni virtual chats. The next one is on Tuesday, 22 September, and it's a discussion on heritage. 
heritage is important to people's identity, their history, and their capability to, you know, be active agents of democracy and social economic development and achieving our the sustainable development goals. Today's event was brought to you by the University of Pretoria's alumni relations team, one of the best, I think, um, in this space. So we want to hear your opinions on this event, whether you found it informative and helpful. So please complete the final poll for the day on Slido. The question is now up. It says, how likely are you to refer this event to business colleagues and other alumni with one being very unlikely and 10 being extremely uh, likely. So please uh, answer the final poll. And that remains for me, as Vice Chancellor, to thank you very much. Our alumni, the ministers, and yourself belong to arguable, I know I'm the Vice Chancellor, but I can say arguable, the top university in South Africa, the top <laughs> university in Africa, and one that compares globally with the best. Thank you very much. You come from the best. You are the best. <laughs> Thank you, bro.